Good morning, everyone. Um, as I've been reflecting on the past year of 2020, there have been several situations in which all I can do is sit back and laugh at the complete lack of control and order that I've ex been experiencing. And um, one of the uh, most um, memorable experiences of this was in the middle of August when um, my wife and I, who are both teachers, and in the middle of August, we were both wondering um, what our school year was going to be like. We had actually no idea what our jobs would entail. Uh, we have two children. Uh, we had no idea what their preschool or school would entail. And we were trying to catch one last date before the end of summer in order to get a little bit of um, uh, sorry, peace uh, in the midst of all this chaos. And so um, we had a babysitter downstairs and we ended up needing to call a plumber in this moment um, because we had a leak of water. And I went down from our little sanctuary of takeout food and our date upstairs to go check in with the plumber. And uh, I came up back to Debbie and I said, okay, we have good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news is the leak of dirty water was actually sewage and they need to rip out half our kitchen. And in this moment, uh, Debbie just started laughing. And it was you know, not because it was a good situation obviously, but because we just had so little control. There was no other way to react to this. We just both started laughing at the complete um, craziness of the situation. Um, but there was also some good news. And the plumber told us that um, the insurance company would pay for our entire repair and we would get a new kitchen. And um, even though we were excited at that moment, we didn't want to get our hopes up because um, the insurance company won't necessarily give you a new kitchen unless they can't match your old one. Um, so I, um, we kind of tried to moderate our hopes a little bit. And um, I actually dared to make the joke to Debbie that we shouldn't count our kitchens before they match. But, um, you know, even though we were trying to moderate our hopes and, uh, and, and not get our hopes up too much, uh, things are different with God. Um, with God, we can and should expect great and joyful outcomes with certainty. And today we're going to look at um, some promises of God on which we can depend. We're going to be looking at what the Apostle Paul says about God's faithfulness in the book of Romans. If you've been reading along with um, the one story readings, we've been taking a journey through the Bible in a year. And if you've been moving along, you're right about to head into the book of Romans, which Sam also preached on last week. And um, we're going to be looking at what Paul says in Romans about uh, looking back at the uh, story of Abraham in Genesis. So this is kind of a way of looking back across the whole of the Bible at the story we've read from the beginning. Um, and um, we'll be looking at Genesis, th Genesis through the lens of some things that Paul says about it. And what Paul's going to talk to us about um, and what we're going to see in the life of Abraham is that God's promises, unlike the promise of our plumber, um, are 100% dependable because God is perfectly faithful to his word. And his gifts, unlike the gift of a new kitchen, um, is not just a slight improvement in our life now, but eternal life. And rather than being based on an insurance policy or some kind of legal obligation, it's actually based on his own unbounded love. So the main idea that we're going to be looking at today is that um, God gives us invincible joy through his lavish promises of resurrection, redemption, and unbounded love. Now, today we're going to be looking at this in two types of prophecy about uh, the coming of Jesus. Uh, one is um, a straightforward prediction of the future, um, but another one is a little bit less uh, known. It's called a type, and I just want to briefly explain a type. A type is a situation where God accomplishes in miniature in the life of an Old Testament person, what he's going to accomplish in a greater way um, in the future in the life of Jesus Christ. Um, with all types, there is a sufficient similarity to Jesus to see that the same God is orchestrating the events behind both stories. But there's always a sufficient difference to account for the fact that as, uh, as God in human form, Jesus was perfect and always um, outdoes whatever happened before him. Um, or in other words, the way I like to put it is that God always was going to save the best for last. So as we take a look at Genesis, let's pause and pray together as we go to look at the scripture. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that you offer us an invincible joy that can't be taken away. Lord, I pray for each person here 
that whatever challenges we may face that may try to rob us of joy, that, um, that you would replace fear, anxiety, apprehension, or disappointment um, with, with an invincible joy that cannot be taken away that's been secured by your own coming and resurrection. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, in order to talk to you about our main um, topic today, I would need to give you a little bit of a backstory. So um, the backstory I'm going to describe using chapter numbers because I think it's convenient. But at the beginning of Genesis, um, God um, curses humanity and the earth for Adam and Eve's disobedience. Um, as they break his command. And after that, um, however, God also promises a blessing in place of the curse. And he tells Abraham in chapter 12 that all nations would be blessed through him. Uh, moving to the next chapter, God also promises to Abraham that he's going to make his offspring like the dust of the earth, and he's going to become a great nation. Moving on a couple more chapters, but several years in the future, God appears to Abraham again and asks God what's going on since the promise hasn't been fulfilled. And God tells him that he is Abraham's shield and that he is going to protect Abraham and that Abraham's offspring will be like the stars in the sky. When Abraham believes God's promise that his offspring will be like the stars in the sky, it says in the Bible that um, this faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. If we move one more chapter, but about 10 more years down the line, Abraham still hasn't received any children. And so he tries to uh, fulfill the promise of offspring through another woman, one of his maidservants, and has a son named Ishmael. And for a while, it seems that Abraham may have believed that Ishmael was going to be the vehicle through which God fulfilled all of his promises. But then in Genesis 17, God appears to Abraham another time and overwhelms Abraham with an incredibly lavish promise. Not only, says God, are you going to be the father of a nation, but you're going to be the father of many nations. Your wife, Sarah, is going to be the mother of your heir. And um, she's uh, kings of peoples are going to come from her line. In response to this overwhelming promise, it was, seems to have been greater than what Abraham was expecting. He laughs with unbridled joy at the overwhelming promise of God. And in response, God says that the son he's going to receive, the son of promise, will be called Isaac, meaning laughter. Now, in this backstory, we see a few ways in which um, there is a prophecy, what we called earlier, a type. And um, the apostle Paul in the book of Romans, in Romans 4.19, mentions that Abraham's faith is the same kind of faith that uh, we have who believe in Jesus, because he was believing that God could do the impossible. He believed that God, it says in Romans, that without weakening in faith, Abraham faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. And even though they were past the years of having children, Abraham believed that God could do the impossible. So there's a similarity between the story of Jesus and the story of Isaac in that God was going to do something impossible. Um, and also in the fact that there was going to be a miracle child. Um, Isaac was a miracle child born to a hundred year old father and a 90 year old mother. Um, but we've also seen that in a prophecy of types, God always saves the best for last. And so in the birth of Jesus, God actually performed an even more outstanding miracle in sending Jesus to be born of a virgin. So let's move on to a little bit more about um, the story we're going to focus on today, which is the story in Genesis 22, if you'd like to follow in your Bible, where um, God tell, uh, does this. It says in Genesis 22, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moria. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Now, this commandment must have absolutely stunned Abraham, who was pinning all of his hopes on the miracle child he had received on Isaac. And um, 
it is in many ways uh, a terrible and horrifying experience to, to consider. And before we um, continue, uh, I just wanna mention a couple of things about how horrific this seems to be. Um, first, I wanna clarify that in the Old Testament, the God of Israel and the God of Abraham, who is generally called Yahweh, um, was the only God in that region who repeatedly expressed a personal loathing for child sacrifice. For example, um, when God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah, he said of some of the people in Israel, they have built the high places of Baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal, something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. Um, in another place, um, through Moses, God tells the people, you must not worship the Lord your God in their way, because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their gods. So when the book of Genesis was written, this commandment to Abraham would have been shocking to any Israelite because they knew that their Lord was personally set against this abominable practice of child sacrifice. But in the context of Abraham's life, it's even more surprising because <clears throat> Abraham has been on this journey of faith with God for so many years. Now, to illustrate what's going on here in the context of Abraham's life, I'd like to just share a little bit about my own family. Um, in my family, in our family, um, Debbie is what we call the secretary of finance, uh, sorry, the secretary of logistics, because she's really good at organizing and planning, which is not my strength. And I'm the secretary of finances because I'm good at math and it doesn't stress me out. And so we have these different areas that we, um, we facilitate in our family. Now, Debbie has repeatedly told me that she wants to take a post-COVID vacation. So um, I'm always trying to cook dinner in the house. I'm trying to always not eat out. And I find every possible way I can to not spend money so that we can save for this post-COVID vacation. And I find that if I'm very disciplined in my cooking and not ordering a takeout uh, or Postmates, that um, I can save about $200 per month. Now, in the context of our family, God's command to sacrifice Isaac would be kind of like me calling Debbie on the phone and saying, hey, Debbie, um, before I get home, can you go to the bank and withdraw the $5,000 that we've been saving over the last two years? And I need you to withdraw it in cash and then go put that cash in a pile in the backyard and light it on fire and then cook our dinner over it. And if I did that, um, of course, Debbie would have no idea what I was talking about. And, I mean, to do that, she would have to trust that I had some kind of crazy plan in mind. But if you heard this request from me, um, not knowing that I was always trying to save money, you would think I was just a foolish, perhaps even idiotic um, waster of our family's resources. But if you know that the backstory is that I'm always trying to save money for this post-COVID vacation, which we want to enjoy together, the question in your mind wouldn't be, why is Patrick um, an idiotic waster of his family's resources? The question in your mind would be, why is Patrick acting in a way so contrary to his normal character? And that's really the question that we come up with God's command to sacrifice Isaac. Um, uh, both in the larger context of God's moral commandments, as well as in the prom repeated promises he's made that um, Isaac is going to be the child of promise, um, we see something that on the surface seems completely contrary to the promises of God and the, the character of God. One last thing that we should note before we move on is that this is one of the only situations in which Abraham doesn't question God. If you read the Genesis story, you'll find that he frequently questions and even bargains with God for things that he wants. But in this situation, he simply obeys. And um, it's, very, it's very odd that he does that. So let's think about why he does that and take a look at his actions. Um, I believe that the first reason Abraham simply obeys is that he had an invincible joy based on the faith that God could raise the dead. If we take a look further down in the text, um, it says in verse um, it says in verse four, on the third day Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, "Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there." 
we will worship and then we will come back to you. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was in this situation, I don't think I would have included those last few words, we will come back to you. I probably and you kind of chill for a while and we're gonna go have some worship time in private. And I probably would have left out the part about how we're both gonna come back. But it's interesting that Abraham specifically mentions, we will come back to you. And I'm convinced that Abraham's um, words here um, indicate that he believed that God's promises were so unbreakable that even if he were to sacrifice the child of the promise um, all the way to, to his dying, that God would raise him back from the dead in order to fulfill that promise. And the Apostle Paul actually refers to this in Romans 4.17, where he says that Abraham is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that did not exist. And so we can see that in moving forward with obeying this command, Abraham believed that God would and could raise the dead. He had the same type of faith that we have in Jesus, that God is a death-defeating God. And here again, we can see that Isaac is a type. He's like Jesus because he he is going to his death, but he is unlike Jesus in the sense that God was saving the best for last, and a literal resurrection from the dead was reserved for the life of God's son. I want to pause and just remind us that in Jesus, we can have invincible joy because we experience, through Jesus, victory over death. You know, this year, the threat of COVID has deprived many of us of joy in a variety of ways. Um, there's um, minor things like, um, you know, not being able to dine at our favorite restaurants and um, public areas like SeaWorld being closed, but there's also the pending threat of actually catching COVID and dying. Now, I want to be really clear that I'm not judging or condemning anyone with anxiety about COVID because that's a totally normal reaction to a pandemic, but I do want to remind us that in Jesus, we don't have to be afraid of dying because we have a resurrection promise of eternal life. And if you or anyone that you love is afraid of dying because of the pandemic, the victory of Jesus can change your fear into joy. And even aside from COVID, we all face many trials and sorrows in, throughout our lives. Um, there's no one who doesn't. But when we have faith that there's a resurrection at the end of life, we know that no matter what happens in the middle of our story, the ending of our story is guaranteed to be a happy ending. We can trust that God is going to uh, repay all our suffering with a weight of glory that's beyond comparison. And so I wanna encourage you today to hold on to this joy because God has already signed the deed of our inheritance of eternal life with the blood of his own son. Now, I also want to take a look further down this passage at um, another moment where Abraham talks with his son. And it says a little bit further down in, um, in, verse, in verse seven, it says that is six and seven, it says the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Now, this seems like a really awkward moment. What's Abraham going to say? Um, actually, you know, you're the sacrifice. You know, he doesn't say that. What he does is he changes the awkward moment into a not awkward moment through faith. And what he actually says is, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And you see, Abraham knew that God is worthy of all worship because he's our creator. And if God asks for a sacrifice, a sacrifice needs to happen. But Abraham also believes that the same God who accepts the life of a sacrifice in the place of our own to pay for our sins would have mercy on Isaac and that he would provide a substitute so that Isaac could be saved. In fact, Abraham's faith was accurate. A little bit later, it says that in verse 13, it says, Abraham looked up and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by his horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering 
instead of his son. Abraham's faith that God would provide a substitute is the same kind of faith that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 4. He refers back to the, to the uh, promise that Abraham believed and how it was credited to Abraham as righteousness. And this is what he says. This is why faith was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins, for our sins, and raised for our justification. You see, Abraham shared our faith that God will provide a substitute. And in Jesus, our joy can be invincible because our joy in our relationship with God um, doesn't depend on something we do. It depends on something God has already done. In Abraham's life, it, he believed that God would, would provide a substitute for that moment. But in Jesus, we can see that God has saved the best for last, and he's provided a substitute not only for the life of Isaac, but for everyone in the whole world who puts their faith in him. And this gives us invincible joy. As uh, David uh, says, uh, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. It is happy to have your sins forgiven and to know that you're on a right relationship with God. And the first step on this path is to give up trying to be good enough on our own and to justify ourselves through our actions or our excuses, and to ask Jesus to be the substitute for what we cannot accomplish. But, you know, the lifestyle that follows this kind of faith is also a lifestyle that has given up striving for redemption on the fumes of human effort. Um, the story of Abraham reminds us that ultimately God is the only one who can provide a sufficient sacrifice to please himself. Nothing we can offer to God is going to impress him or pay for our own sins. And this is true on an internal level with our own individual actions and in relationship to God. But I want to remind us, as we look at the world around us in 2020, that this is also true for the, society, the problems of our society and our world. Take, for example, the increasing concern that many people have in our society and in our congregation for writing social injustices, and especially the issue of dismantling racism. This goal cannot be accomplished without people, starting with ourselves, individually coming to God, recognizing that we are have sin in these areas in our own hearts, and asking God to provide a substitute for our own justification and forgiveness. But then turning to the society around us, we don't have the power ourselves to dismantle social injustices or racism or poverty or any other human ill. God is the one who has the power to dismantle it. And the sacrifices that he calls us to make in fighting these things are not, are not sacrifices which are, are going to depend on our own ingenuity and power. They're going to depend on God's creative ability to create things that don't exist. This Advent, I want to encourage us to take a spiritual inventory of where our own spiritual joy and um, self-esteem depends on our own spiritual success and our own sacrifices to God or for the common good. Let's join Abraham in letting our joy depend on God's provision of a sacrifice and his power to redeem our world. Now, as we move on in the Abraham story, we've already seen that um, Abraham had faith that answers two really difficult questions. Uh, the question of, of how Isaac might die and the question of how God could receive a sacrifice. But we haven't dealt with one last really difficult question. And that is, doesn't it seem inhumane and even horrific for God to command Abraham to bring his son through the physical agony of death by sacrifice? And I think the answer to this really has to lie in the fact that Isaac is a type of something else. Isaac is a type of Jesus Christ. See, God reserved the real pain, both the pain of sacrificing a beloved son and of being the son who was sacrificed for himself. We have seen that um, in types of Christ, there's a similarity to show the same God is at work in two stories. But there's a difference because God always saves the best for last. See, in the, pro in the story of Abraham and Isaac, a father and a son both gave their best in an act of total submission to God. And, um, but what God asked of Abraham and Isaac was only a test. 
which would ultimately result in them hearing the audible voice of God, promising them an eternal blessing. But what God asked of himself, both God the Father and God the Son, was not a mere test. It was a genuine act, a voluntary sacrifice that was willingly performed by God the Father and God the Son when Jesus experienced mocking, beating, thorns in his brow, and crucifying agony. And what we see in the story of Abraham is that at this very moment when Abraham shows his willingness to offer his best and the most precious thing in his life to God, the God responds to him and says, it says, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld from me your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Why did God affirm this promise to Abraham and Isaac at this time? It was because God, over a thousand years before the time of Jesus, was looking for someone worthy of being the ancestor of his own son, who was also going to offer his best for the world in order to give us redemption. <clears throat> Paul, the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, actually refers to this when he says, he who did not withhold his own son, but graciously delivered him up for us all, how will he not graciously give us all things? You see, the exact same words that are in the Greek text of Genesis, we find here in the text of Romans 8.32. Paul is saying that what Abraham did in offering his very best to God is a type of what God did in offering his very best to us. You see, <clears throat> there's nothing in our lives that can stand up to this logic. If God showed the same faithfulness to us that Abraham showed to God in that moment, there's nothing in our life that we can face that stands up with that. There's nothing in our lives we can face that can stand up to the logic that God is always going to be with us. When Abraham and Isaac heard the audible voice of God giving them this promise, they knew for the rest of their lives that God was going to be with them. And we can have that same assurance that God is going to be with us because he's already given his very best. Now, I just want to share a, a personal example of this, I think, in the life of our church that that's been very touching to me. And that is the fact that, you know, in recent not in recent uh, months, our church has actually shrunk to a very small to, to a fraction of its former size. And sometimes the missing friends and faces are a source of sadness. But when I look at this circumstance in light of God's unbounded love, and I remember that God, if God gave his own son for us, how will he not graciously give us everything else that we need? I see the size of our church in a different light. Uh, I remember that the same God who promised to Abraham that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky is going to be faithful to his promise to multiply his people, whether in our congregation or out of it, so numerously that, that they're going to be innumerable. There's going to be so many people that are in God's family at the end. Um, but I also believe that God, that the God we serve is gracious enough to um, bring people to our church and increase our numbers again um, at the right time. And whether we're waiting for that time, as Abraham waited for many years, or whether we experience that time as he did when he heard the audible voice of God give him this promise, we can have faith that the greatness of God's love is more than sufficient to counter every difficulty in front of us, whether in our church or something else. There is no difficulty in our life that can stand up to the question, he who did not withhold his own son, how will he not graciously give us all things? Meditating on the greatness of God's love can refresh a burned out and weary soul. And imitating God's love can lead us, like Abraham, to perform acts of sacrifice in the uh, cause of bringing God's redemption to the world. And so I want to challenge each of us during this Advent to think about the situation in your life that seems the most hopeless and, the, and where God seems the most absent. Where is God calling you to put something in your life in the perspective of his unbounded grace? knowing that since he's already given his son, he will certainly take care of everything else that we need. In a moment, we're going to be going into a discussion group uh, to discuss um, where that might be for you. 
Uh, maybe it's believing in the literal and future resurrection that God has promised to those who trust Jesus Christ. Maybe it has to do with um, believing that your sins are forgiven and that Jesus is your substitute. Or maybe it has to do with putting a situation in your life in the context and the perspective of God's unbounded grace. But before we go into our discussion group, I just want to remind you that um, there's no obligation to share uh, or to turn on your mic or your video when you go into a group. Um, and so there's no pressure to do that and no expectation. But if you want to process um, something that you've heard today uh, in our message so far, um, feel free to do that. So um, I just want to conclude by mentioning that um, today we've seen um, what seems to be on the surface an example of horror and um, human sacrifice also is actually a story that offers us a basis for invincible joy. And our joy is invincible because it's based on a God who raises the dead, who provides a substitute for sinners, and who proves that he will give us everything by, we need by giving his best for us. And so this Advent, I wanna encourage each of you to look at the situations that are the most difficult in your own lives where God's love seems the most absent and find an invincible joy in this God who is faithful to the end.